Good morning. Everyone having a good morning? So I'm still really jet lagged, so I woke up at around 1 a.m. local time, and I decided to redo all my slides and my demos. So my slides don't match my demos because that's not how that works. Uh, none of it really worked out. All the demos still work, but none of it uh, matches up anymore, and I'll explain it as I go through. But this is virtual reality and IoT. We're going to do some demos of basically what I normally do is I actually carry uh, five devices with me, and I set four in the audience, and they interact, and I have a Unity demo at the end, and it shows how to get those devices to interact. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States, and taking... Uh, uh, circuit boards with wires hanging out of them and a whole bunch of battery packs and flying internationally going to both Paris and then here is just not something I wanted to do. So I don't have all of my hardware. So I recreated the hardware interactivity in a, another app. That way I can still show the demo. So sorry that it's not as, as good as it normally is, but I just didn't feel like getting harassed by customs three or four times. So my name is Jared Rhodes. I'm an MVP for Microsoft Azure and a Pluralsight author. And if you need to find me, on any social media, it follows this pattern. That's also the name of the company that I uh, own and work for. Um, I have a Pluralsight course that should be coming out. Uh, it was supposed to come out this week, but uh, Thanksgiving, it'll probably come out next week. It's identifying existing products, services, and technologies in use for Microsoft Azure. It's a course where basically it, getting started. If you go to Microsoft Azure and you have something already existing, in your data center and you want to know how to get it to Azure, this course walks you through not migrating your app, but how do you figure out what service is equivalent to my service and how should I get started in a migration? And then we go through the different tools available to help you with that. All right, so what are we doing in this talk? First, we're going to talk about devices used in IoT, and we're going to cover the different variants of OS's developer tools and actual hardware that you can use. Then we're going to talk about the IoT portion. So once we have a device, we're going to connect it to the internet, connect to a cloud, and show how we can transfer those messages and use, uh, make something useful out of them. And then we'll talk about the reality portion, both virtual and mixed reality, and how you can get started with those and, and what usefulness they could have for you. All right, so first I always like to start with why IoT. And this was really good when I added it into my slides like four years ago, and it's becoming less and less and less relevant. But I'll just keep doing it every time. So this is the Sony Vio. It came out around uh, 2001. It was only uh, 2.76 pounds. It had a 10-inch screen, 850 megahertz, 250 megabytes of RAM. So this, at the time, was priced at around $1,500. So back in 2001, you could get one of these for about $1,500. You'll notice that it has like 802.11b and not Wi-Fi. So back then, finding Wi-Fi wasn't really established as well. So you had 802.11b and you could use Wi-Fi, that kind of stuff. Let's compare that to the Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, it's a 1.2 gigahertz, 64-bit quad core. It's got uh, 802.11n uh, for wireless. It's got Bluetooth, Bluetooth load energy. It's got a gigabyte of RAM, four USB ports. 40 GPIO, full HDMI, and on, and on, and on. And so that you can buy by itself for about 35 bucks. If you get a whole kit, you're going to be running around $55. So again, that one was you know, $1,500, and this is around $35. So why IoT? It's because now we've got hardware so cheap and so powerful. You don't have to be an embedded developer to get something up and running uh, for IoT. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to talk about how to take some devices, and then we're going to connect those devices to Azure IoT Hub, and then we're going to use an Azure function to send the messages from Azure IoT Hub to the SignalR service in Azure, and then we are going to push from the SignalR service down to any number of devices that are listening. In this case, it's just going to be my PC running Unity. This is not exactly what we're doing. This is a slide I made before I went through the process of building the entire demo. What we're actually going to be doing is in the center section where it's the Azure function. That doesn't work. We're going to be doing it the old way where we just forward the message to a topic, and then that topic gets read by a SignalR instance. All right, so four devices. Uh, devices, many shapes and sizes. For development boards to get started, you can get started obviously with the Raspberry Pi, in this case the Raspberry Pi 3. 
Uh, you can get that for around 35 bucks. You can get something more powerful like an Odroid or a Rock 64 media board. Or you can go even more low powered and get a, a No OS Arduino Mega. Or keep going down, you can get a micro bit. Or you can go all the way down to a pocket beagle. You can see the pocket beagle. That's a, uh, a quarter. It's about that big. As far as OS support, when you want to start getting developing on IoT, you can actually go full-fledged Windows, uh, Windows Server, and Windows IoT. Full operating systems, full UI backing, everything you'd want in your normal development experience. You can do UWP apps, um, even on the Raspberry Pi. So you can go full-fledged Windows if you want. Or you can work with a more embedded Linux, right? You can go everything from uh, Raspbian or an embedded Ubuntu all the way down to a Yocto build or, or anything that's much more uh, compact. You can use a real-time operating system. So real-time operating systems actually, instead of you being encapsulated from the kernel and building on top of that, uh, the real-time operating system has uh, you build into the kernel, uh, if you want to call it a kernel. But there's a, basically multitasking is not fully extracted from you. And it's for systems to where, again, last time I talked in this room, I talked about a saw. And if you stick your hand in the saw blade, it catches and make sure that it doesn't cut your finger off. For real-time operating systems, you can take it and the hardware can just not worry about all the other multitasking capabilities. You can have something that sits on top at the highest priority and runs the hardware to make sure that uh, timing critical things happen. Or you can go no OS, no OS at all. And you go pure microcontroller, Arduino, Atmel tools, whatever you want, uh, all the way down to where you just write code that executes in a loop on a microcontroller. So the dev tools. Most surprising to me, as I've been doing this for a couple of years, the number one tool I've encountered is Notepad. Notepad is used by embedded developers around the world as their number one tool for editing C code. Yep, Notepad. I, I don't know why, but that is what I see the most often, and it's used uh, by some of the largest hardware manufacturers in the world. I walk up, they'll just have Notepad open, and I have no idea how they actually ever get anything to compile, but they'll, they'll have a code base of a couple hundred files, and they open up each one individually in Notepad and just edit everything by hand with no IntelliSense or anything like that. You can use Atmel Studio, so everyone, I mean, is, is everyone in here familiar with an Arduino? Right, so Arduinos are Atmel chips, or at least they were when they started, Atmel chips on a helper board to get you started, and then they wrote a special IDE and compiler so that you could use the Atmel chips. If you want to get started with either the Atmel chips directly or Arduino, you can use Atmel Studio. So Atmel Studio uses the, the Visual Studio shell, the uh, current one that's used in 2017, and if you want to do Arduino, you can just download the Arduino add-ins, and it's a full Visual Studio shell experience, but it also has the uh, hardware um, simulators, it has hardware connectivity, the JTAG debuggers are built in, so if you have a JTAG debugger, it knows how to do breakpoints and everything for you, as long as you have it wired correctly to the chip. So Atmel Studio, it's a great one if you're in the Atmel space, which a lot of the IoT using Arduinos is. In fact, going back to the Atmel Studio, if you want, and you want to get real fancy, you can just write all of your code for an Arduino uh, and then use Atmel Studio to do that. And then with Atmel Studio, you can pull the flash and get the hex file off of that Arduino and then take the Atmel chip directly and flash it with that hex file. And you never have to work with the uh, Atmel uh, C or assembly directly. You can just use the Arduino and pull the flash off of there. You can use C Lion. So I've been using C Lion for a lot of my clients where we have to do C and C++ development. Uh, it's a JetBrains tool. It's in the same family of IntelliJ, WebStorm, and all the other ones. Uses that same shell that they use, except this is a C make build, or at least it uh, started as a C make build uh, first IDE. And it's just, it's nice. It's got all the IntelliSense and everything I need built in, and it's uh, made for C and C++. Also, in the IoT world, we use a lot of Python. So you can use PyCharm for all of your Python needs. You can use Visual Studio. Uh, I'm going to be showing an example of using Visual Studio for Windows IoT and then uh, just Windows 10 in general for the universal Windows applications. You can deploy those directly to a Raspberry Pi. Then you can use Visual Studio Code. It's the Swiss Army knife. It's not, in my opinion, as good as having a screwdriver when you need a screwdriver, but it, it's like a Swiss Army knife. It has a screwdriver in there somewhere, and it kind of works like a screwdriver. 
All right, so let's talk about connectivity. So the first thing you have to do if you want to get started with an IoT project, you have to get the device connected. And there's plenty of different ways to get devices connected. So first, we'll talk about how you can set up the devices to connect. And if you saw my last talk, this is the same set of slides on the different architectures to wire up the devices to connect to your ingestion engine. So first, we're going to talk about the actual setup of the uh, hierarchy of connecting devices. Then we're going to go over the actual uh, physical layers of connection. So first, for connecting devices, you can set it up to where every device in the demo I was talking about, every device connected directly. They're all just sitting out in the crowd, and they hit the Wi-Fi, and they talk straight to the, uh, the cloud for its ingestion engine. So just a direct message pass through, or direct message connection from each device to the cloud. You can do it where you connect each device to a gateway. So when you connect each, each device to a gateway, the, the gateway actually handles multiple different things like c connection pooling or throttling or whatever you need. And each device doesn't have to know that it's connected to a gateway. It may think it's connecting to the cloud and the gateway handles acting as a middleman so that you don't have to worry about anything for those devices. This also works for devices that are either A, too dumb to connect to the cloud, because there is a TLS minimum requirement, and some of the chips that, that we use in the embedded world don't actually have enough horsepower to encrypt their messages before they send them. So they'll send them directly to a gateway. Another reason you would have a gateway set up like this is because the, you're using low power devices. So low power devices are not always on. They actually are asleep for 90% or 99% of the time, and they have interrupts that will wake them up. So if I had a device here that were to detect motion, the device would not be on, it would be in sleep mode. And when you walk by, an interrupt would fire, so it goes from low power mode to powered, connects to the gateway, and then sends the message, and then goes back to sleep. And you do that because if you don't do low power devices, they have to have batteries. Uh, a Wi-Fi device can burn through a battery in a few days that a low power device can use for 15 years. Uh, you can do a multiple connection tier, so I can have devices that connect to a gateway, or excuse me, I can use multiple uh, gateways. So I can have devices that connect to a gateway. I can have gateways that connect to a gateway. I can have devices that connect to a gateway that has a gateway connecting to it. You can tear this up any number of different ways you want, and then each one just acts as a pass-through trying to get it up to the, the final destination. And then finally, you can do the same thing connecting to the actual ingestion engine. You can connect a gateway to the ingestion engine, multiple devices connecting to it, while also having devices connecting directly to the ingestion engine. And then we have the actual connectivity options. You've got Wi-Fi, LoRa, Sig Sigfox, Ethernet, LTE, uh, LP WAN, Bluetooth, Satellite, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. You can connect these things a million different ways. All that matters is at the end, the final device can connect to the cloud and actually send messages and receive messages. And I've been on projects where we've used Wi-Fi, we've used Ethernet, we've used Bluetooth, we've used LP WAN, we've used LoRa, we've used LTE, and each one, uh, the, some of those were all on the same project, some of them were on different projects. You end up using all of these, and it sounds like a lot, but mostly as a developer, all you see is there are bytes coming in over here, I gotta translate them to this device, and then I got to send something over Wi-Fi or I got to connect to the internet over Ethernet once it gets to the gateway. Okay, so let's take a quick look at a Windows IoT demo. Now normally again I'd have the devices with me where I could deploy them and you could see, hey, look at those devices out there getting deployed too. So Windows IoT, uh, who here has done any Windows 10 development or universal Windows applications development? I'm glad you're with me then. All right, so one of you has done it. So Universal Windows applications are what came out with Windows 10. And in Windows 10, the idea was that you could develop with one coding model and you could deploy it to the HoloLens, you could deploy it to the Windows Phone, you could deploy it to Windows 10, you could deploy it to Xbox, you could deploy it everywhere. That was the general idea. No one really liked it, but that was the idea. So the way you got around being able to write one code base and add on all these different uh, extensibility points. So what you would do to get started, you'd go new project, and the, you see it in Visual Studio, there's the universal Windows applications. To get started, you could just do a blank app. And then when you needed to add anything specific for what you wanted to do, whether it was 
HoloLens, whether it was uh, Xbox, you would go to the Add References section, and there's actually a new uh, tab called Universal Windows, and then you can go to Extensions, and here's where all of the different extensions for UWP came in, right? So if you wanted to do mobile, back when Windows Phone was still alive, you would select the mobile extension. And for IoT, we would select the IoT extensions. And the IoT extensions gives us access to the hardware layer. So it gave us the GPIO pins and the uh, serial, or not the serial pins, the GPIO pins, and uh, I'm trying to think of all the different pins it gave us, but you get the idea. It gave us access to the uh, hardware, so on a Raspberry Pi, which is what this was deployed to, let's take a look. Uh, so this is a, a button driver, and all it did was we have the GPIO pins now available to us, so we can capture them, and then we can actually listen for the events coming out of them. So let me give you a look at what the, the final product was supposed to look like with the devices in the audience. So once I tell you we have access to the GPIO pins, there had been devices in the audience with buttons hanging off of the GPIO pins. And then what happens is we get in the game and there's a bunch of lamps sitting equidistant wherever the... Let me see if I can get one of these turned on for you. So there were lamps just sitting there ready to be turned on. And if you pressed one of those buttons, we'll figure out where top right is, the lamp would turn on, right? And so I'm actually using the same code in this app that isn't a device that I was on the device to actually send that message of a button being pressed, and that just gets routed through the cloud and then back to this computer to turn on the lamp. So that's all you need to get started with Windows IoT, and publishing Windows IoT was just as simple as targeting the device, so you would select from your debug settings, you would select a remote device, you would give it the IP address, and if the device was running Windows IoT available for uh, debugging, it would just deploy to that device whenever you click debug. It gave you the full interactivity so you could do breakpoints, you could see everything that was going on with the device just like you would any other Windows application. So that was the device demo. Now let's talk about once that data has gotten off of the device and it's in the cloud, let's talk about the different architectures that we can use to actually utilize the data coming off of our devices. So IoT architecture can be basically broken down into five steps, and we'll show you that that's the basically. And then in the next couple of slides, we'll take that basically and wire it in all different configurations so that it's no longer basically anymore. So the first thing that you have are the event producers. So the event producers are most commonly thought of as the actual devices. In IoT, that could be something that fits in the palm of your hand. It could be a mobile device if we're doing something that gets geolocation points. It could be the gateways. Anything that produces normally time series data or something you pull off another IoT system. But that's the first step is actually data ingest or your event producers. Then once you get that data created, it needs to be pulled into whatever system is going to be consuming it. So you have your stream ingestion. So that's Kafka, Azure's IoT Hub, Azure's Event Hubs, or AWS IoT Core, or any num number of other systems that can actually handle that much data coming in at once. And then you have the hard to read transformation and analytics. So once we have data coming in through the stream ingestion, now we need to transform it. So transformation of streaming data is a little bit different than it is with at rest data. So a lot of us are used to SQL or flat files or NoSQL or, or whatever. Data at rest. When you talk about IoT, a lot of the data is streaming data. So in this case, things like Stream Analytics, Apache Storm, Azure, data, Azure Databricks, Spark Streaming, they actually handle the stream as it's incoming. And one of the m important things about handling a stream as it comes in is understanding that that is time sensitive data. It came in at a certain point, it was created at a certain point, and you need to manipulate that data within that, those time variables uh, as an additional data point to at rest data. Also understand that if you try to query over a giant window, just sort of like in SQL, you're, you're asking whatever stream ingestion engine to hold data in memory and start manipulating it at very large scales. 
after you've got your transformation analytics, you need to store the data. So you can use any, I mean, you've all you had to deal with uh, data systems. So Cosmos, SQL, uh, SQL Data Warehouse, Elasticsearch, flat files, who cares? Just you got to put the data somewhere once you've already passed it through the uh, transformation um, and analytics phase. And then after that, finally, you've got data, you've transformed data, you've saved data, now you're going to use data. So as that data comes in, uh, you can put it into mobile alerts, you can put it into a dashboard in Power BI, automated device action. So if this device says the temperature is too high, turn off the thing over there that could explode, that kind of stuff. The same thing again, but in much bigger letters. First, event producers, then stream ingestion, then transformation and analytics, and then serving storage, and then finally, presentation and action. So that's the simple version of the architecture. Let's get into the more advanced versions of the architecture. This is still a standard flow. We've got the device, and then we've got this. This is really all the event data creation. Then you've got ingestion, so IoT Hub. You've got your stream parser, so your stream analytics, uh, machine learning, and then the different ways of processing that incoming data. Your storage, and then finally your actions. Now with that, you have different concerns when you create an IoT system. So some systems are more concerned with data to analyze. So a system that I had to deal with was with Northrop Grumman, which is a a military uh, contractor. They were working on a plane. They had to do tests for the shear on the uh, uh, metal, on the wings, over certain stresses. And whenever they did those tests, they would generate around a terabyte of data per second. And they needed to stream, upload, and then process that data. And so because they don't have to use that data in flight, they're not really concerned about spikes or anything like that as they produce it. They're on a cold path. They're just worried about actually pulling in the data and processing it. So in an IoT system, you will have cold path processing. So in cold path, in cold path processing, you're not so much worried about the data transformation step. You're more worried about just getting the data in, getting it stored, and then processing it through the different transformations that you need to to get that data usable for the final consumption. And that's more of what we're used to when we have to deal with LAR, when we deal with any data set, right? Cold path is what we're, we usually, someone puts in an order in a system somewhere, it gets saved, and then later it gets analyzed. Hot path is a little bit different for IoT. So again, hot path is, I have a security system that just went off. It says someone's breaking into a house. I need that alert to go out instantly without ever really worrying about a disk persistence step. So we have our devices, and then finally we have our ingestion engine, so we're taking in all of that data, and then we're going to split the data. We're going to store the data for later in these two steps. But while we're storing that data, we're going to uh, uh, send another copy to the stream processor so we can actually analyze that data in flight. And so if we see something that we need to act on, then we can actually, instead of worrying about, again, the other step, we push it straight to consumption. So for the IoT architectures, you're going to have a cold path and a hot path for most systems, where you're going to take the data, and as it comes in, I showed you the architecture diagram of those five nice layers. What's really going to happen is, is when it gets to about the third layer, all of those layers are going to start stacking on top of one another in different configurations, because as the data is in flight, it needs to be stored for uh, persistence, so that for compliance, it needs to be stored for analysis. It needs to be processed to make sure that any uh, real-time rules are upheld, all of that kind of stuff. So you have cold path and you have hot path architectures. Okay, so now we've talked about the actual ingestion architectures. Now we're going to talk about the eventing systems within Microsoft Azure. So first is the Azure IoT Hub. So that's still the ingestion. We're going to use uh, for Azure IoT Hub, the reason you want to use it, if I give you any Microsoft published Azure diagram about IoT, there's going to be stuff outside of the cloud. There's going to be a big blue line called Azure IoT Hub. And on the other side is everything in the cloud. So for, for the Azure architecture for IoT, Azure IoT Hub is how devices get their data into the cloud. And it's how the cloud talks to those devices. So it has bi-directional communication. You can authenticate every device out in the field. And we're talking about scaling that to millions and millions of devices. So to expand upon that, you get the bi-directional communication. 
Uh, you can use any language you want. You can use C, uh, Python, Java, uh, JavaScript, any, any language you want, they, they pretty much support. In fact, it's all really just a C SDK that they map every language on top to. You can use uh, HTTP, um, ANQP, or MQTT for your different communication protocols. And then you can do all kinds of device management and communication with Hub. And you can also scale it. You can scale it up. It's, it's cloud. You can scale it up and down if you've got money. You, you want to scale it up. If you don't have money, you can scale it down. And then you can do all kinds of fancy stuff. Uh, this actual this message routing. So I told you that we're not going to do the Azure function way of pushing the data into the SignalR hub. What we're going to do is we're actually just going to use message routing. You can just tell hub, hey, I've got messages coming in. Here's a query. If they match this query, go ahead and push them to another event hub or an Azure uh, a service bus topic or a service bus queue or just log them directly to disk. And then for that enterprise integration, you've got all the monitoring, health, uh, mapping, and everything you would need for an enterprise solution. And then you get end-to-end -end security. If you ever read an article online that has IoT in the title, it's about security. They don't call it IoT when it works. They call it IoT when there's a security breach and it takes down a network through a, a DDoS attack. So end-to-end -end security, number one concern of Azure IoT Hub. You can it, it basically, if you use Azure IoT Hub correctly, your devices are secure. Uh, if you try to connect twice with the same device ID, it's going to start uh, blacklisting that device. If you if you use the wrong IDs, it'll let you know. If you have a bad certificate, it lets you know. Uh, so, end-to-end uh, -end security is number one concern for IoT Hub. Who here has used Azure Functions? Anybody? So Azure Functions live in the serverless world with all of the other, um, uh, you know, the new craze. It's just like uh, AWS's Lambda. You're going to write a fun you're going to write a code block. You're going to write some code, and you're not going to worry about the actual in uh, enlisting of the other resources. And I'll show you what I mean by that. But instead of having to worry about here's a connection string to something over there, now when you start up parse this connection string, and I want you to connect and read it for a message. When a message comes, you don't worry about any of that. You just tell it, here's the connection string. Here's the entry point for my code. When a message comes in, call my code. And Azure, in Azure Functions, will make sure that you don't use that function. It's not floating around in memory and causing you to incur cost unless that message is coming in. It's easy. I'll show you. And it's multilingual again. You can use Python, Java, blah, 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 blah. Any of the languages you really want to, you can use. So the way we were going to do it was very simple. We were going to have Azure IoT Hub. Functions was going to read off of IoT Hub. And then that function was just going to forward it directly to the SignalR service. SignalR service is provided to us by Azure. It's a new service. We won't be using it because I couldn't get it to work. And here is why. Sometimes when you read documentation, you make assumptions. I made an assumption last night at around 1 AM. And my assumption was there was documentation on how to have a function forward a message to SignalR. All right. There was documentation on how to have um, an Azure function automatically trigger a new, off of a new message to Azure IoT Hub. And I've done that before for clients, so I know it works. And I made an assumption that I'll take these two things, put them together, and I'll have a demo. After about five hours, and that's not a joke, five hours of fighting the dependencies and finally getting all of the dependencies to work together so it would actually build, what happens is, is I learn that if you want to use the SignalR extensions for Azure Functions and the Event Hub extensions for Azure Functions, they conflict. So basically, they have a different set of dependencies that have different greater than and less than signs around version numbers. And once you get it all put together, you get it started, you're very happy, you've been awake since 1 AM, it's 5 o'clock in the morning, that screen finally comes up, meaning everything's working, there's no red text. And apparently, it's going to go really slow because I'm talking faster than it's going. But there's going to be no red text. You're going to see the green text. It means it's working. And then it's going to actually 
like all the way down in the function. It downloaded the source code. It asked me, hey, I've got an exception. Do you want to download the source code? Which meant I wasn't going to get it to work for this demo. But yeah, so you can do this. There's just currently a bug in the dependencies between these two. What a function looks like, though, is it looks like this. Yep. Yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm doing it slowly, but I'm doing it. So this is the basic function entry point. You're just going to have a function, name it whatever, give it the attribute for the function name, and when you deploy it to Azure, it'll automatically reflect into this assembly, see that attribute, and know that, it, well, technically what it does is when you publish this, it creates a manifest. So let me actually tell you right. When you create, when you actually publish this, it's going to create a manifest, and that manifest will list out this function as an entry point, and then when your function start in the UI, you'll see a list of every function that you've had here that was listed in the manifest, and then that will be what's run by Azure. But this is your entry point. So this is the same idea as the, the main method, except what they did was was they added in these nice attributes that you can put in the method, <coughs> and that will automatically populate these objects whenever an event comes through. So right here, I have this IoT Hub trigger, and it's sitting on top of this event data message. So whenever this starts, it looks for this connection string in my app services, and it does all the wiring for me. I don't have to worry about opening the connection or anything like that. It goes ahead and does that all for me. And then this event data is populated every time a message is read off of IoT Hub and passed into my method. This signal R portion is actually another auto wiring that I don't have to worry about. So if I put this attribute and I have this object, it actually acts as an output from this function. And it auto wires up everything I need to do for this object to automatically, when invoked properly, to send a message along the way. If you look at the documentation, the easiest way to understand this is you can, you can create a function for, let's say, blob storage. You can have two blob accounts. And whenever a new blob message comes in, you can literally just do this blob equals this blob. And it'll automatically write from one to the other. And all you did in your code was wire it up and put an equal sign in between. So that's Azure Functions. Let's look at Azure uh, IoT Hub. So Azure IoT Hub is the, the entry point for the cloud for all these devices. To get started with a new I, um, IoT Hub, or any of these actually. So to get started with any of these, you can just go to new, type in IoT Hub, or type in SignalR service. And they're very simple to get started. You just click on them. You click Create. It'll give you a new screen. You fill out these three, and you're done. You just create it. It adds it to your resources. And once it's in your resources, you can navigate to it and use it. So for this IoT Hub instance, I had five devices. And so I can actually look at, manage uh, each of these devices individually if I'd like. So I can, I've got five devices. Let's say that bottom left button is suddenly, I don't know, compromised in some way. Like someone physically walked up to it, unscrewed it, and started fiddling with it. And that made it unstable, so it's sending me messages that it's unstable. I can actually just disable this device. I can do this through the UI or programmatically. Uh, or maybe I felt like the keys were uh, compromised. So I can take the keys and I can just uh, regenerate them. I can do all kinds of stuff, manage all my devices either through this UI, or I can go ahead and change those devices uh, programmatically through the API for IoT Hub. You'll see in here we have the connection strings. That's how the UI that I was showing you is connecting to IoT Hub. I just literally took all of them, made a big dictionary of the name and the uh, connection string. And then whenever I change that combo box, I just create a new instance of it connecting to IoT Hub. Let me show you how difficult it is once you have a connection string to create uh, the connection to IoT Hub.
that's the code that I write to actually parse the string and, and open the connection, right? So just create from connection string. And this is how I send messages. Uh, I send in some object. I serialize it. I get the um, ASCII version of bytes from it. And this is all I have to do to send that message. I just, I just say send async, and I'm done. You can do fancier stuff if you really feel like it. You can make sure that you get a confirmation message that it was sent. You can do all kinds of bidirectional communication. But for a very simple demo, all you have to do is just send async and give it a, a, a bytes, and that's it, and you're done. Once those, goes up, once those go into the cloud, what I'm doing from there is I'm routing it. So normally, or not normally, normally we do route it. What I wanted to do was I wanted to use the function to pull it directly off of IoT Hub. What I'm doing here is instead you can just create routes. So I have a, a topic in Service Bus. Uh, does everyone know what a topic is? Okay, topic is just a, uh, if I send a message to a topic, any number of services can subscribe to that topic, and it creates a copy of that message for each subscriber. That's all it does. So I'm taking the message from IoT Hub, and I'm sending it to that topic. I literally, this is all I had to do, was I just said true for all messages. You can write any query you want here to investigate either the system properties, your application properties that you put in the message, or the body of the message, and route to Event Hub's queues topics or persist it directly to disk. Once it goes into that topic, I have an ASP.NET website that I've deployed that has a SignalR hub on it. And all that hub does is it connects to my topic. It, it has to serialize the data and then create a, a add the application properties and the system properties into the JSON body. But then it just sends that data. So in SignalR, uh, I can't go into SignalR too much due to time constraints, but SignalR is a real-time communication web technology for ASP.NET and ASP.NET Core. The idea is I can have real-time communication where I can just open a connection and send and receive messages. All I'm using it for in this case is to push messages that are coming out of IoT Hub and off my topic. All the clients that connect to SignalR are now going to receive the, the uh, the new messages that I'm sending down. And we'll get to how I'm receiving those messages in Unity once we're done with the next few slides. All right, and I got an email or something. All right, so virtual and mixed reality. So when we think of virtual and mixed reality, a lot of people's uh, initial thought is games. And that, that is the primary use right now for virtual and mixed reality. Uh, real quick, does, does any, uh, normally I can do this in a smaller room. So normally I ask, uh, what's the difference between uh, mixed reality and augmented reality? And usually someone gives me an answer. Someone raises their hand and they'll try to differentiate between mixed and augmented reality. So I'll just tell you how I remember it happening. Microsoft took a big, big bucket of money, a couple of million dollars, right, invested it into the HoloLens over six years, millions and millions of dollars. And right before they were about to announce the HoloLens to the world at Build Conference, Pokemon Go came out, like literally a month before. Pokemon Go, you could walk around, hold your phone up, and a Pokemon would appear right there in the screen, and they said, this is augmented reality. And Pokemon Go, when it first came out, was everywhere. It was worldwide phenomenon for augmented reality. And Microsoft, who had just invested millions of dollars into their big augmented reality product, said, this is not augmented reality. This is mixed reality. So that's the difference between augmented reality and mixed reality. All right, so some other uses of uh, virtual reality and mixed reality. Uh, they actually use it for PTSD treatment and treatment of other uh, uh, psychological ailments that uh, you need immersion. So it allows you to put people in situations where they could easily remove themselves from, and it allows them to be put in, in different environments without endangering themselves while they're being monitored easily. Uh, medical training, this was pretty obvious, right? Instead of cutting up people or cadavers, you can get a more immersive uh, experience a lot cheaper and without having to have the, the dead shipped around. Architectural modeling, so this is actually pretty good for uh, just trying to build out, uh, a, a, say, architecture modeling 
because that's the picture I had. But you know, th any 3D modeling. If I want to put together a 3D uh, uh, object, I can uh, interact with it, see it, move it around using mixed and augmented reality. Real estate, so 3D tours, not just and uh, uh, not just buying and selling houses or properties. You can actually use augmented and mixed reality for like vacation planning. That's that's the new big thing. I can I can put on the headset and I can, I can actually see the hotel room or see what the view is outside, just falling around from from some cameras. And then finally, military training, uh, kind of like the medical training. It's a lot simpler. You don't have to actually blow up buildings or get shot at as much, right? You can sort of do an immersive. Uh, military military training exercise it doesn't work so well for like live fire but uh, driving a tank it's a little bit more helpful and you don't have to actually have a tank running around okay so why virtual reality and mixed reality so this is a question both for business and for us as developers so uh, this year 2018 22 million headsets are expected to be purchased and if I had the graph you'd see a nice hockey stick where their expected number of headsets and uh, VR and um, mixed reality devices to reach hundreds of millions, if not uh, close to a billion devices within the next five to 10 years. So every major tech company has a product for it. And I typed that out, I, I typed it out and I was like, wh whenever you do this, there's always someone who can like, uh, what about, I don't know, Nortel? I, I, don't know, I don't know a tech company. So I actually started looking up, I was like, Cisco has it, Apple has it, Google has it, uh, Microsoft has it. Everyone that I could find in the, in the major tech companies had not, not a one-off product. They had a flagship product for MR and VR. And then finally, for most of us, it's, it's accessible to us. And in my personal opinion, it's, it's even more accessible than AI. So right now, data science is, is big to be pushed uh, from on high. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with us going on Glassdoor and seeing that data science has a few extra uh, numbers on the salary than, than developer or architect. But I think that VR and AR is actually more accessible than any of the data science or AI stuff to us as developers. I'm going to move a lot quickly now because the timer over here is getting low. So some VR and AR devices you can look into. Magic Leap, it just came out uh, within the past couple of months. It's uh, I don't know. It's the one I'm hearing the most about uh, from the people who actually developed, or who actually developed a VR and AR. I haven't had a chance to play with it because the development kit is in the uh, like three thousand dollars. You've got the Vive, uh, which I'm sure everyone's seen the the Vive out in in the different stores. You've got the Hololens. You've got the Oculus Rift, uh, PlayStation VR, Google Glass. Uh, I went to an industrial IoT talk uh, about Google Glass where Agco. They make big tractors, and by big tractors, they're multi-million dollar tractors. They make like five every year or something like that. They probably make more than five, but you get the idea. They are giant tractors that do entire uh, 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 enterprise or industrial crops. Uh, they use Google, Google Glass on their factory floor for both safety and ease of training and a whole bunch of other things, but they actually have a full-fledged uh, uh, Google Glass integrated into their, their workflow. All right, so we're going to take a look at Unity. Good thing about Unity is it's free to get started. It's multi-platform, so you can deploy to web, you can deploy to the HoloLens, you can deploy to Xbox, you can deploy to, you get the idea. It deploys to almost everywhere, mobile. Uh, it has a very large community. If you have any question on Unity, you can Google it, find out that you found the answer from three versions ago, and then Google it again. And it has C Sharp as a primary language. It used to use C Sharp and JavaScript. They've dropped JavaScript support. And now it is C Sharp as its primary, and as far as I know, only language. Do I have anything else? OK, so what we're going to do, we're going to connect to the SignalR service. Or right now, instead of the service, we're connecting to a SignalR instance hosted in a web app. And then the main game loop is going to read off of an in-memory message queue. So the messages are coming out of SignalR service. They're going into the message queue. And then the main game loop will pull them out as it gets them. All right. This is usually the nice big like finale. Because when I start, I get you kind of lulled in. And, and there's, there's this device. And it's got a button on it. And you press the button and some lance chase color. Then I pull out, I've got a fifth device, and I keep the fifth device with me because it's got a DHT11. If you ever work in IoT and you do demos, DHT11 is the hello world for IoT. It's a temperature and humidity sensor that takes uh, uh, three wires to get started. And what I do, let's get this guy to where I can actually showcase it. 
I take the DHT11, and I have it right up here plugged into the computer where you couldn't see it the whole time. And what I do is I first, I breathe on it. Kind of weird, especially with a microphone, but that's what we do. We breathe on it. And what we're doing is, is uh, we're creating uh, that extra, oh, I started the wrong project. Uh, what we're doing is we're, we're giving it that uh, moisture because it's a humidity detector. And in my Unity game, I am actually listening to the SignalR messages as they come in. And as the humidity gets higher and higher, once it gets past a certain point, wait for the message to get routed, then it starts to rain. So I start breathing on the DHT11. As I breathe more and more and the humidity goes up, it'll start to rain. And I actually wrote a whole lot of code to make this really cool to where as the humidity keeps going, it gets more intense rain. And as it goes away, it gets less intense. You won't get to see that in this demo, but it's really cool. All right, and then once I get done, <laughs> I literally have a hair dryer that I pull out. And I take the hair dryer and I start uh, hitting it with the hair dryer to actually warm it up. Because first, I want to get the humidity off of it. And second, I'm looking to get the temperature high. Because once the temperature gets high, it catches everything on fire, right? So this is just sending those messages from the device to IoT Hub. They get routed to the SignalR service, and then we're consuming that in Unity. Who here has done any Unity development? All right, more than UWP. All right. So in Unity, you can actually use in Unity you can actually use Visual Studio. So if we go to Assets and we go to Open C Sharp Project, as long as you've set up. Unity to open this in Visual Studio. It'll just open it in Visual Studio. And since it's C-sharp, you get everything you need in, uh, for a C-sharp project in Visual Studio. This is not, this is not uh, what you're used to if you're used to developing uh, application websites or whatever, where your code normally has an entry point, And then that entry point, uh, uh, you know, you run through a, a, a linear function. Uh, game development's very different. You're usually writing scripts, and you, you're in the game engine. You're going to put an object, and you're going to tag it with that script. So if we take a look, like I've got the, uh, let's say the, I got four lamps. And for each one of those lamps, I've attached a lamp script. So in your uh, solution, when you open it up, you can add your C-sharp code, and you can create objects or scripts that you'll attach to your objects in game. So let's open it up. Let's see, lamps, got a lamp, script. And whenever this script is invoked, it's not, so there's not an interface that drives your, your methods. It actually is looking for uh, methods by name. So whenever it's started, it, they, whenever uh, a script hits the start point, Unity is basically going through on this cycle and hitting all the, the methods as it goes through a life cycle. So whenever this script is invoked and it, it looks for a start for an entry point, and then I grab the, the lamp and I grab all the things I need out of it to change its color, and then I give it methods to turn on and off. As I showed you from the diagram, I've got a main loop. So when you want to update, there's going to be an on update method. Now, we all know that since I'm grabbing something from off the UI thread, I can't update directly. I have to marshal it into the main UI thread. So I have a little helper to help me do that. But mainly what I'm doing is I listen for this data. I'm looking for the values of it. And then I've got these objects, so these scripts that I've attached to objects, they're hydrated, and I've grabbed them out of memory. And I'm using those within this loop. Every time I get new data, all I'm doing is I'm calling a method. So in the case of the lamp, I gave it a turn on, a turn off, and a toggle method. And then in my loop, I have the little callback to marshal it to the main thread. But basically, I'm saying, hey, if, if you see a device with this device ID, toggle it. I've got a manager to help, but all it's doing is it's calling toggle on the whichever device it thinks it should toggle. So you're, you attach scripts, your C-sharp code attaches. You don't really have an entry point. You're more of reacting to events whenever you do uh, game style programming. And that's how I map all of this together. 
Another good thing to show you before I close out is I did not make the rain. Where are you at? Oh, here you are. I didn't make the rain. I didn't make the fire. I don't know how to do any of that. I, I couldn't if I, like, if you held a gun to my head and you said, you know, make, make, make the thing rain, it just wouldn't happen. I'd, I'd get shot. They have an asset store, and in the asset store, you can just go in, you can type in rain, and they have rain prefabs that you can just download. If I click the download button, it automatically includes it into my project, and then within my project, I can just go, here it was Rainmaker, I can grab the prefab, and I can drag the prefab onto the Unity uh, engine game, or whatever you want to call it, and now I can automatically use that as an object in my C-sharp code. If you ever want to do anything really neat, uh, if you get a chance to use a HoloLens or any of the other mixed reality devices, you can set that up to work in Unity. Just put a sphere in the middle of your game, do nothing else, just put a sphere there and have it be a physics object with a, uh, coll with a uh, collision detection. And then just turn it on somewhere. Just start it. Because what it'll do if I'm standing right here, it'll map out the entire room and the ball, now that it has gravity, will fall. And if I'm looking at that table, if that's where it's centered, it'll fall, hit that table, and then roll. But if I'm looking over here, it'll just fall straight to the ground. So if you ever want to try something interesting, you get a chance to use one of those, a HoloLens or the other MR device or AR devices. It's really neat to just see how it maps the world out for you. Okay. Thank you for uh, following that uh, uh, quick talk. If you have any questions, I'll be outside. Thanks.